Hi guys! Today we're going to be talking about American Girl, as specifically one of my least favorite aspects of the franchise, and a lot of people's least favorite aspects. It isn't something that I like lived through or have strong memories of, because American Girl is something I only really got into within the last few years. The video I made ranking the historical characters in summer of 2021 it was actually the first time I really did any heavy research into the company, into the dolls, and the characters. And while making that video, I came across something with a lot of the characters. A good amount had two separate collections, two separate outfits they came packaged in, and in some cases, two separate book lines. Which, if you are really into American Girl, I'm sure you're like, uh, duh. But for me, this was a new discovery, and not a particularly great one. So this was due to American Girl deciding to fully overhaul and rebrand its historical line in 2014, changing the line's name to Be Forever. So for some characters, that meant having their collections completely redone to fit the line's new standards. It also meant that characters introduced after 2014 during the Be Forever era would have collections and clothes that fit the brand's new image, which was noticeably more colorful and marketed with a more modern aesthetic, which is just at kind of the antithesis to a historical collection, right? But I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. In this video, I want to talk a little bit about how this rebranding came to be, the context of it, and also look at the characters and dolls that were being produced during it and compare them to the original line. And for some context for myself, I've mentioned this a few times, but I am a costume design major. This is a topic that's particularly interesting for me, because historical fashion is a huge interest of mine. I've studied it pretty extensively, both academically and just really for fun, too. So I wouldn't call myself an expert on it or anything, but it's just something that I love to talk about. So I think this is going to be a fun video for me. If a little ranty, but you guys usually like that. So, where to begin? I guess at the very beginning. And I won't go over like the entire history of American Girl, but I do think its origins are pretty pertinent to the conversation. Our story begins in 1986. A woman named Pleasant Rowland founded the Pleasant Company, who in turn would manufacture the first three American Girl dolls. A lot of articles and pieces on American Girl place a big emphasis on the fact that Rowland was a former school teacher, which she was, but she also had a few other notable careers too. She was a news reporter, a textbook writer, a publisher of a children's magazine, and prior to founding the Pleasant Company, she also created a reading program called Super Kids, which is actually still in use in some schools today. The thing to note here, obviously, is that Pleasant Rowland cared a lot about education, and that was always the original purpose of the American Girl dolls. The first three characters were Molly, Kirsten, and Samantha. All were from different time periods in American history, paired with books that gave perspective on their lives and the aspects of the time period that they're growing up in. And unlike the textbooks I grew up with here in the Texas educational system, they were pretty committed to getting it right. Even though the line was ostensibly aimed at young girls, the books covered some pretty important topics. And it wasn't perfect. The first batch of books were written in the 80s, after all. But it did broach things like child labor, poverty, the effects of war, PTSD, slavery, etc. Some books have even been retroactively criticized for possibly being too disturbing. Most significantly, Addie Walkers, who lived in the 1860s as an enslaved person, escaping to freedom in the first book. But a lot of people also regard Addie's books as one of the first things that actually taught them the horrors of slavery in ways that their own school system would not. In 1998, toy giant Mattel would purchase the Pleasant Company from Rowland for a respectable sum of 700 million doll hairs. There weren't immediately too many changes under Mattel's ownership. They would continue to release historical characters, starting with Kit Kidridge in 2000, but there was a bit of a, a shift, if you will. Mattel began to place a bigger emphasis on contemporary dolls, most notably with Girls of the Year starting in 2001. 
And a contemporary modern day dolls did exist under the Pleasant Company's ownership, but Mattel sort of made them the central part of American Girl. Originally, the historical characters weren't even really referred to as historical characters. They were just the American Girls. But Mattel really differentiated them from the contemporary collections, and over time, the historical collection as a whole would just kind of fall by the wayside. That doesn't mean the historical dolls produced under Mattel were bad, and quite the opposite. I think some of the most well-researched and important dolls came in this time period. It was never really the designers or authors or research teams that were doing a bad job. It almost always came down to Mattel's marketing, or lack thereof. So that would bring us to 2014. In an attempt to update the historical collection for a new generation, Mattel decides to completely overhaul it, starting with a name change. The historical collection was rebranded to the name Be Forever, and despite how well documented the public dissatisfaction with this decision was, there's actually very little information on exactly why Mattel made the specific decisions they did. And some of these decisions just seem like outrageously arbitrary. For one, they retired the characters who existed under the Best Friends category, which included Ivy Ling and Cecil Ray, who were some of the very few characters of color in the lineup. Ivy to this day still being the only Asian character in the entire historical collection. The educational aspects of the books were scaled back significantly, so they would usually have spreads devoted to just providing historical facts or context about the time period, but these were reduced drastically. And overall, the branding became more modern, noticeably more, uh, for lack of a better word, girly, and all the outfits were redesigned to fit a newer, more modern aesthetic. So, all across the board, there was less of an emphasis on historical accuracy and education, two things that were very vital in American Girl's original vision. And this just seems so incredibly insulting on Mattel's part, like they're essentially saying, oh, the girls don't care about learning or history, they just want pretty colors and shiny fabrics. Which I'm probably exaggerating the reasoning here, but that is honestly the impression I get just looking at this rebrand. So why don't we look at what they changed, yeah? I'll go through each of the characters, talk a bit about their original collection, and then also their rebranding. We'll start with Molly. So Molly wasn't actually around for the initial Be Forever rebranding. She had been retired the year before in 2013, but she was released in 2018 under Be Forever, apparently entirely exclusive to Costco. As such, her redesign is probably one of the least dramatic ones, and she didn't have a full collection either. The original Molly doll is so cute. I know she's a, a polarizing character, but I do really like Molly. Her story takes place in the mid-1940s during World War II, and her outfit really reflects that. It's simple because it had to be in that time period. It has a very handmade quality to it, and it's pretty timeless in the way 1940s fashion tends to be. And her Be Forever redesign is just... It kind of the same outfit, except now she has a plaid skirt and plain top instead of the other way around. The woven pattern on the cardigan and the silhouette is still very much of that time period. This is one I actually don't have any big complaints about, and that's probably because it was produced later in the Be Forever timeline, which I'll talk about how things actually improved a, a little later on. Kirsten was retired in 2010 and not resurrected for Be Forever, so she was spared. Samantha is the last of the original trio, and actually one of my personal favorite characters. Her time period is also one of my favorite eras of fashion too. She was also retired prior to Be Forever, but was brought back. And unlike Molly, it was with a full collection. Uh, her story takes place starting in 1904. Samantha's original collection is just so good. And it really shows the company's commitment to accuracy down to the way the outfits are constructed. Obviously, they couldn't fully recreate Edwardian gowns and doll scale, but they came very close with the resources they had. I love that they even recreated parts of the clothing that would be considered, like, ridiculous on a doll today. Like, her meat outfit and her skating dress and the tea dress too, which I own, 
They all have that very, very low waistline and the very baggy, pin-tucked bodices. It's a very specific silhouette that if you didn't know it was meant to be early 1900s, would be absolutely nonsensical on any other kind of dress, but that was the silhouette of the time. And the fabric choices are very deliberate too. There's tartans and flannels and lace and velvets. The dresses, they sometimes have these very elaborate collars. Because Samantha, you know, she was extremely rich, so they had full reign to have a lot of variation in her outfits. And then there's her Be Forever collection, starting with her meat outfit, which I guess is not entirely inaccurate, it could pass, but it really lacks the right silhouette and the complex construction of her original collection. It's too fitted, the waistline is in the wrong place, and it's just very obviously designed to appeal to more modern sensibilities. It also really emphasizes another problem with the Be Forever collection, and that is its tendency to color code the characters. It kind of assigns Samantha a pastel pink color scheme, which, uh, don't get me wrong, you know I love a good pastel pink, and it's not like Samantha would never have worn pink, but she would have been considered too old in this time period, I think, to be constantly decked out in pastels. And again, it's a, it's a modern sensibility, because the color pink also, it wasn't heavily associated with femininity yet. Just look at her old bicycling outfit compared to the Be Forever one. Like, that is just a modern day peasant top. Then there's this dress called the, the Frilly Frock, which just comes with a pair of metallic lavender boots. The flower picking outfit, which again, is just a, a modern wrap dress. And it's not like this style of dress didn't exist at all, but the silhouette and how it should fit just looks so wrong. The actual inspiration from the time period is there, but it's just so vague. I wouldn't be able to guess this is meant to be from the early 1900s by just looking at it. And next is Felicity from the 1770s, and she was also retired and brought back for Be Forever, but she also lacks a full collection. And I'm kind of grateful for that, because this period specifically is one of my least favorites. And I can't say why, but I wasn't looking forward to doing a ton of research on it. But thankfully, I didn't have to. Felicity, 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 oh my god. Felicity's original collection is nice. Just again, personally, not very interesting to me. I think she really emphasizes the lack of specifically children's clothes in this era. You know, girls her age just dressed like adults, and you definitely see that, especially with Felicity's formal outfit. I still think she would hate these outfits, but it's still historically accurate that she would wear them. You know, being a free spirit in 1774 didn't necessarily absolve you of wearing stays and petticoats. And then we have her Be Forever Meat outfit, which I, I really don't like it. I think it is just so garish and frankly ugly. It's ugly. The colors and the style of it just remind me so much of a, a Tudor gown, but like specifically a Tudor gown Halloween costume. The shape and the silhouette of it are not incorrect, and honestly the colors really aren't that inaccurate either. However, in my research, the only dresses I could find that really resembled this one were very formal ones, not really the type of dress you would wear on a day-to-day -day basis running errands. Also, I'm pretty sure the petticoat here is just a panel sewn into the dress and not an actual separate layer, which is a nitpicky criticism, I know, but it's just a kind of grading given the past collection's commitment to at least attempting accurate outfit construction. Next, we'll look at Addie Walker from the 1860s. Her original collection is I think pretty significant in the way it showcases a wide variety of clothing options that are visually interesting, but not at all unrealistic for what would have been Addie's class level at the time, and her family struggling with finances is something that is actually brought up in the stories. So you'll see outfits that are, you know, not necessarily as elaborate or detailed as Samantha's, but they still tell Addie's story really well. And like Molly's, they also have a sort of homemade or hand-me-down quality to them, which when making a doll would really not be your first instinct to do, but it is entirely realistic for the time. Addie's clothes would have all been made or repurposed by her mother. Her redesigned meat outfit for Be Forever is, again, not one that is like wildly inaccurate, 
The fabric pattern is a little questionable to me. I think it's a similar case to Felicity, though, where they just went with what was more visually striking than what was more reasonable and functional for an everyday outfit. The change also just kind of bothers me on a personal level, because in the book, Addie's meat outfit, her pink dress, is the first piece of clothing that she receives after escaping to freedom. It's the first dress that she truly owns, and it's an extremely significant item to her. And I know, in the Be Forever books, they just update the text to match her new dress, but there really wasn't a good reason to change it to begin with. It's just arbitrary at best, and in poor taste at worst. But, I don't know, that's just me. And again, there's the insistence on color coding. And next, Josefina Montoya, representing the 1820s. And this is another time period where I'm just really not that knowledgeable on. From my research, I can conclude that her collection is relatively accurate. A lot of her outfits revolve around her specific chores or duties, so they're as utilitarian as they needed to be given the specific culture and women's outfit standards of the time. And the same goes for her Be Forever collection too, which is just not that large. What she does have in it are basically the same outfits she has in her original, with just different fabrics or more details added on. Although, together, absolutely not the worst thing they could have done with her. Then we have Kit Kidridge for the 1930s, specifically the Great Depression, and I really adore Kit's original collection. There are a lot of references in her collection to flower sack or feed dresses, which were clothes made out of flower sacks or feed bags. It was more cost effective in this time to ship them out in fabric sacks, and some companies even put interesting patterns on their sacks, specifically for the women who are buying them to make clothes out of. And I haven't fully read Kit's series, but I am pretty sure this comes up with some of her clothes. A Kit is also notably a big tomboy, and we see this reflected in some items of her collection, as much as I think they could have gotten away with without being too anachronistic. The construction of some of these do look somewhat modern to me, actually, but I do wonder if that's due to this now being the Mattel era and they were cutting corners a little, or if again it's just this period having kind of a, a timeless look overall to its clothes. A 1930s fashion has a reputation for being rather boring, which I don't think is entirely true, it was a very glamorous period, but only for a very specific subset of people. Which, with Kit's family losing their finances and living in abject poverty during that period, they unfortunately wouldn't have access to the more elegant clothing of the time. So it makes sense that Kit's wardrobe would be a mix of the dresses she had when her family was wealthy, and new outfits that are more simply constructed, and again, that feed sack aesthetic. Which again, I really have to commend the fabric selection on most of these. And then we have her Be Forever redesign, which... Ugh. This is just not a 1930s dress to me in any way. I could see this being sold at like, Oshkosh Bagosh right now. A girl Kit's age would have sleeves on her outfit, or a cardigan at least. And the a cupcake shape of her skirt, once again, that's just something I associate with being more formal for that time period. There just really wasn't a lot of thought put into the setting or the time period at all with this one. And some of the other clothes in the Be Forever collection are a little better, though the specific color schemes they choose kind of reminds me more of like the 50s or 60s aesthetics. But they also just kind of remove a lot of Kit's personality from the collection too. Even the outfits where she's doing chores, her clothes have very pretty patterns and are extremely fitted to her body. Which, that's not to say these specific clothes wouldn't have existed, but they just don't make a lot of sense for the context, and especially for Kit's character. After Kit, we have Kaya, representing the 1760s, uh, specifically living as a member of the Nez Perce tribe living prior to permanent European settlements. Akaya didn't really have a large collection to begin with, at least not with clothing, and that's very intentional. She was designed to be accurate to the lifestyle of the time, and as such, you know, she didn't have a wide selection of extra party dresses. A lot of Kaya's extra outfits are, in a sense, modern outfits, the kind you would see at powwows today, which is something that continued with the Be Forever rebrand. They didn't even redesign her meat outfit at all, so again, thankfully, not at all the worst thing they could have done. Then we have Julie for the 70s, 
And the 70s are one of those time periods of fashion where people usually think they know 70s fashion, but they don't really know 70s fashion. And as you'd expect, Julie's original collection does a great job of really capturing fairly realistic 70s fashion. There's a lot of really cool pieces that I think really showcase the kind of experimental vibe a lot of 70s fashion had. I really love her floral jumpsuit specifically. Like, you just look at that and you have to say it's funky. What, what other word describes it? And the 70s was such an extremely varied time as far as, like, popular styles went that it's actually kind of hard to make an outfit that would have been wildly ahistorical for the time. Which is why I think a lot of media tends to resort to the very stereotypical, like, hippie bell-bottoms look when they want to signify the 70s. Which... Surprise, surprise, is exactly what Julie's Be Forever redesign did. This is just like the most stereotypical 70s hippie Halloween costume they could have possibly given her. Like, they think their audience is so naive, they couldn't possibly know Julie lived in the 70s unless they put a big floral peace sign on her shirt. And the same for the rest of her clothes in the Be Forever collection. It's just a bunch of eye-melting bright prints and weird psychedelic floral patterns. It's just a very surface-level understanding of 70s fashion, and yet again a very modern idea of it. And it's just unnecessary. Julie's outfits were already so cool and colorful, they didn't need a redesign. Like, you look at authentic photos and fashion catalogs from the 70s, and then you look at actual Halloween costumes, and you just very clearly see where Be Forever Julie took more inspiration. One thing I will say about Julie's Be Forever collection, though, I love the furniture from it. I haven't really talked about furniture playsets because I am not by any means an expert on historical furniture, but Julie's Be Forever furniture is so good. I'm obsessed with her bathroom. I want to live there. Next we have Rebecca for the 1910s, and the 1910s are another era that is pretty often overlooked as far as clothing goes. It's between two very significant eras of fashion, you know, Victorian and Edwardian before, and the 1920s right after. The 1910s had its own selection of interesting fashions, but they were mostly for adult women, not necessarily for children Rebecca's age. So a lot of Rebecca's clothes are the identical silhouette of the drop waist and knee length skirt. And a lot of her clothes are also very plain and undetailed, which is entirely accurate because Rebecca was not only a child living in the 1910s, but a child living through World War I. So like Molly, it was sort of a necessity for her to have simple clothes with a lot of versatile pieces that could be worn for several different occasions. And honestly, her Be Forever collection is not that bad. She might be the only character where I actually kind of prefer her Be Forever doll to her original one. I do think, again, there's that insistence on color coding, that they kind of act like purple and blue were the only fabric colors available in 1914. And like Samantha's, I think they put the waistline a bit too high for what would have been in fashion for the time. But otherwise, I could honestly see a lot of these added onto her original collection and fit right in. I think the fact they chose primarily solid fabrics and not printed patterns really helps that, actually. Her holiday outfit was the only one where I was like, oh, that doesn't look quite right. But I did a little research, and there is actually precedent for some dresses in that time period having an overskirt with an unusual hemline like that. So, I guess you win this round, Be Forever. And this is really where things kind of pick up. Well, not entirely, because after this, American Girl would introduce a few other historical characters just to immediately retire them once the Be Forever rebranding happened. But once we get past the initial rebranding and redesigning, and American Girl starts to introduce new characters under Be Forever, they do a much better job. And I think it's because when American Girl characters are first created, they always have advisory boards and a team of researchers to ensure everything is accurate. And that continued in Be Forever. However, when they were redesigning characters that had already existed, I don't think they necessarily had access to those same resources, which led to a lot of 
missteps and just not quite the same amount of care as the original collections. That said, I also think the time periods they chose following the Be Forever rebranding were some pretty smart decisions. First, there was Mary Ellen in the 1950s and then Melody in the 1960s, so Decade's already pretty well known to have a very bright, colorful aesthetic that fit perfectly within the new marketing. Some of Mary Ellen's collection, I can't help but be a little nitpicky on. Like, of course, they had to give her a poodle skirt. But by the time her story takes place in 1954, I'm pretty sure that would have already been kind of out of fashion. But I do think it's an outfit they kind of had to include. Like, if they didn't, I can just imagine everyone would be asking, It's the 50s, where's the poodle skirt? And it is a pretty historically significant garment, especially for children's fashion. But yeah, almost everything about Mary Ellen's collection is pretty accurate. I do think some of the fabric choices could have been better, but I'm sure the price of manufacturing these outfits had gone up significantly since the 80s, so I understand. But the patterns, the shapes, the silhouettes, it's all really good. Even the outfits that I think are absolutely dreadfully hideous, like her birthday dress, they're ugly in an accurate way. A Melody's is pretty similar. The 60s was also just a really fun era, very vibrant and colorful, and a little experimental too, which we do see in Melody in that she has a few different kinds of silhouettes. It was also not hard at all to find some specific inspirations for her outfits. Like, I happened upon this sewing pattern from 1968 that's almost identical to one of her outfits, and I almost went down this rabbit hole of like trying to identify and document every specific inspiration for the historical outfits, but if I continue with that, I may have never finished this video, so it may be one day though. But all that to say, Melody's collection, just like Mary Ellen's, obviously had a lot of thought and research put into it. I think both her and Mary Ellen really embody the vibrancy of both of their decades without being too over the top or stereotypical in the way say, Julie's Be Forever collection was. I don't think being fun and colorful is ahistorical, but you can do that and still be of that time period, if that makes sense. The last Be Forever girl is Nenea Mitchell. Her time period is also set during the 1940s, like Molly, but set in Hawaii. And again, from what I can tell, everything is pretty accurate. You know, just looking at vintage photos of Holoku dresses and hula dancers, her collection looks really well done. And I think it's clear they were already kind of phasing out of the specific Be Forever aesthetic, because Nenea's collection does resemble more, to me, one of the more classic ones. Sometime after Nenea's release in 2019, American Girl dropped the Be Forever branding entirely, reverting back to just calling them historical characters. In 2021, for the 35th anniversary, American Girl sold limited amounts of the first six characters, all in their original looks, and later fully re-released Molly, also in her original outfit. All subsequent new characters, Courtney and Claudie, also lacked the Be Forever branding. So, Be Forever. Where do I stand on it? I think, if anything, it was just entirely unnecessary. And the fact it was only around for like four years proves that. I think its inception was a little insulting, and ultimately irresponsible on Mattel's part. And when it came to redesigning the old characters, it was clear that they didn't have the time or resources they need to really refresh the collections in a meaningful way, especially if it meant cutting down on the much needed racial diversity of the line. So American Girl as a whole probably could have done without it. Mary Ellen, Melody, and Anaya probably would have had great collections regardless if they were released under Be Forever or not. Maybe the branding played a part in those specific characters and decades being chosen, but I don't think it added anything significant. So what do we learn from this? Don't fix what's not broken. Don't insult your audience. Don't rebrand your doll line or else some twink on YouTube with a costuming degree might show up eight years later to call you a flop. All good lessons. In any case, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. It was actually pretty fun to make and do research for. So I hope this didn't turn out to be like incredibly boring. But if you're still here, uh, be sure to leave a comment with your thoughts. What you thought of the Be Forever rebrand, especially if you were active in American Girl as it was happening. Or even if you weren't, you just want to talk about it. I am here to listen. 
And when you're done with that, just be sure to like and subscribe for any future fashion doll content. Thank you.